Good afternoon and welcome to Nickel at Noon. We'd like to begin today by acknowledging the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy comprising the Siksika, Bikani, and Kainai First Nations, as well as the Tsutsina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. The City of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you back to Nickel at Noon. Of course, this is the online edition, and we are bringing you live discussions, presentations about art and culture every Thursday until the middle of December, uh, before we take a break, and then we'll be back in January. Who knows if we'll be online or we'll be uh, in person. That would be, that would be nice. Of course, these events are free and you can register for them on Eventbrite and the full program is available on our website. You're also invited to follow us on Facebook, Facebook Instagram, Twitter uh, and YouTube coming soon. And of course, you're welcome to subscribe to our mailing list. So please reach out if you need information about any of those. Uh, just a few words about um, Zoom etiquette. Please keep your microphones on mute. Uh, we'll hold questions until the end of the presentation, uh, or if you have something burning, you're welcome to, uh, to, to type your question into the chat bar. And please be aware that we're recording these uh, sessions. Now, uh, the final recording, it will only be the speaker. Um, we will edit out your names and faces and the chat. Um, however, if you speak up during the presentation, your voice will be recorded. Um, so just be mindful of that. Um, and finally, I'm, I'm Michelle Hardy and I'm curator with Nickel Galleries and kind of your host today, uh, virtually. And Marla Halstead is managing the, uh, the, the technology today. She is our front end manager and the co-host of this session. And today's speaker is not Dick Abrams. In fact, today's speaker is Mark <laughs> Clintberg. Um, and we're so pleased to welcome Mark. He's a multidisciplinary artist, writer, and curator who works in the field of art history since completing his PhD in art history at Concordia University in 2013. His work has been included in the 2017 Alberta Biennial, the group exhibition Super Young at the Kamloops Art Gallery, among others. His project Floating in a Most Peculiar Way was included in the exhibition Planetary at Contemporary Calgary. And he's presenting, sorry, get that out of the way. And he's um, preparing for a solo exhibition at Latitude 53 uh, this fall in Edmonton. His work is represented in public and private collections across Canada and the US, including the National Gallery of Canada, the Bank of Montreal Corporate Art Collection, the TD Corporate Art Collection, the Edmonton Arts Cal uh, Council and the Alberta Foundation for the Arts. He's represented by the Pierre-Francois Ouellette Art Contemporain in Montreal and he's an associate professor in the School of Critical and Creative Studies at the Alberta University of the Arts. Mark, I'm so pleased to welcome you here. Thanks so much Michelle and uh, thanks Mara Lai for, I think we're getting some feedback. Um, Thanks Marla and Michelle for inviting me and for managing all the technology uh, for today's talk. I'm really thrilled to do this. It is a little bit strange doing it over Zoom, but since I teach at a university and we're completely online, it's becoming more and more familiar. Uh, so I'm, I feel so fortunate to be a visitor on Treaty 7 territory and it's really exciting to see so many participants in today's talk and lots of familiar faces, as I was saying earlier. Um, I've been told that I have between 30 and 40 minutes for my presentation and then, you know, happy, happy to hear questions from you folks. I'm gonna move into screen share mode uh, so that I can give my presentation. Just be one second here. Okay. Looks good on your end, I hope. I'm going to assume the answer is affirmative unless I hear somebody on a mic say otherwise. 
Uh, so one of the works that was mentioned is Floating in a Most Peculiar Way, which uh, is a work that's now available on my personal website, if any of you would like to watch it. It's a video and audio work. I worked with the musician um, Raf Irisari, or he uh, also goes by the name The Site Below, uh, who's a favorite musician of mine to create the soundtrack for it. So if you do have a chance to watch it, I recommend you use headphones. So I've titled today's talk, This Will Never Be Over, uh, after this recent work of mine, which is a, oh, something's not right here, just one second. Oh, that's the way to do it. Okay, here we go. Now we're cooking with gas. So I've titled it after uh, this work, which is um, a recently completed fiber work uh, that is a response to a lot of a lot of things that I've been experiencing and that we as a culture and society have been experiencing uh, globally. One thing I'm noticing is that for some reason on the side of my screen I see an image of all of you as participants and I'm concerned that you are also all seeing that and it's blocking out the images of the work. Is that the case? They can just switch to a uh, speaker view and that should cover it all. More. Hmm. Sorry, folks, if you can just bear with me for one second. There we go. Okay, so now it should just be the images of the work, correct? I, yeah, I, I'm in speaker view and I only ever saw full, oh, full screen okay. images. Okay, great. Um, so this will never be over is a work that I made uh, in a, a kind of starting in a moment of real frustration. And I think I began this work in April of this year of 2020. And it was a response to a lot of comments that I was hearing from people in my professional and social circles, um, comments that people were making like, oh, I just can't wait until things get back to normal or um, wow, it's gonna be so great when this is all over. And I was very disappointed to hear people make statements like this. And I, I know that it's, you know, it's kind of like a figure of speech, right? It's like a pattern of speech to say things like this, but I think it does raise a lot of questions about whether even before my, March 13th, 2020, if, uh, if things were that great <laughs> um, and I mean, first of all, I don't believe there's such a thing as normal. I mean, I, I think that there is an established status quo. Um, and it's something that, that I'm not really content with personally. So, you know, when we talk in universities and in, in institutions about putting an end to systemic racism or de decolonizing our uh, or decolonizing our institutions. I mean, I think that that means rejecting what the status quo is. It has to, because it's very clear to me that the way that things have been functioning in institutions uh, for a very long time has actually been really dysfunctional. And I say that as somebody who is now a tenured associate professor at a university. And so I'm not trying to, you know, pass along the responsibility to others. I see myself as part of the, you know, uh, as, a, as a contributor to the institution and I feel like I have a responsibility to make changes to how I teach and how I function in the institution. So this will never be over is a message that um, when I first posted it on Instagram resulted in a lot of cry face emojis and emoticons and yeah a lot of messages from people saying like oh that's so depressing do you really think that the pandemic will never be over and that's not really the point of this work. Um, the point is that I, what will never be over is our responsibility to each other, our responsibility to stand up for each other and to look out for each other and to also seek out justice for the people that we oppress. And, what, and the we that I'm, uh, that I'm using there, I'm talking about those of us who, who work in universities. Um, not some kind of universalizing we. 
a little bit of technical information about this work. It is um, about the width of my hands, which I guess is around five feet wide. Uh, and it's a mixture of machine and hand quilting using linen and cotton. And it's based on a strip quilt pattern that I learned when I was doing an artist residency on Fogo Island uh, in 2013 and then again in 2014. Um, so I just wanted to thank the women of the uh, Winds and Waves Artisans Guild on Fogo Island who taught me this technique. And um, I've also included some of the quilting knowledge that comes through my family because uh, one of my grandmothers was a very avid quilter. Uh, sorry, another technical issue. Okay, here we go. All right, so I work with text a lot as an artist. I work with textiles a lot as an artist. And I'm, I'm somebody who is kind of ravenous for text. I'm always looking for, um, I'm always looking for scraps of text, I guess, that I can work with and modify either from e everyday speech, like this will never be over, or from you know, historic records, archives, uh, biography, autobiography. And this next piece is connected to a statement that, uh, that you might already know about just based on the work that you're looking at right now. It's a statement that was made by Pierre Elliott Trudeau when he was justice minister at the end of the 1960s. And what he said at the time was that there's no place for the state in the bedrooms of the nation. And I mean, in the 1960s, uh, I think it's important to remember that, you know, this was a time when you could be fired for being sexually non-normative, you could lose a job, you could lose an apartment, uh, you obviously could be a victim of horrible violence, um, and yeah, even up to the point of death. And the conditions of the 1960s have improved for many people who have non-normative genders and sexualities. Um, however, there are still so many people uh, in our own region even who are absolutely victims of violence and who are like, who daily put themselves at physical risk simply by leaving the place that they live. Um, I'm thinking of trans communities, for instance. And so, Getting back to this context of the 1960s, I mean, at the time, Pierre Elliott Trudeau's was, uh, statement was seen as extremely progressive, and um, it was the beginning of changes around anti-sodomy laws in Canada. And uh, yeah, I mean, we just had the anniversary of his statement uh, within basically like about the last year, and there was a lot of media coverage about kind of the good news story of Pierre Elliott Trudeau's statement that there's no place for the state in the bedrooms of the nation and that, you know, the state shouldn't get involved in policing sexuality. But I mean, I think the irony here is that the state is absolutely still involved in policing sexuality inside of what some of us call Canada. Uh, and I think it's an illusion to imagine that it's otherwise. So I wanted to make a work that would uh, I guess, not exactly challenge the legitimacy of Pierre Elliott Trudeau's statement, but ask, ask for a viewer to reconsider the value of that statement and how his statement has been used as an ideological tool to, to kind of convince a, a number of people in the public sphere about um, gender and sexuality as being a wrapped up civil rights issue, as if there's, there's no more work to do um, because now same-sex marriage is possible, for instance, or in the American context, because same-sex marriage is possible and it's possible for gays and lesbians to now join the military. Uh, and, and also to be able to talk, to be able to talk about their sexuality. And I mean, I think that those are real accomplishments and I would never shame anybody for, uh, for, for pursuing a same-sex marriage. Uh, that's not, that's also not my point. Uh, but the point is that Thinking back to the 60s and the 70s and, and even in the present, there are so many, there are so many people of non-normative sexuality and gender who, who are really fighting for, for much more than the right to marriage or the right to join the military. 
uh, and to aspirations that I think are, are really, really vital. So, you know, I'm thinking of different groups in the 70s, for instance, who were uh, gay, lesbian, queer, who are working to promote the abolition of prisons, working to promote the provision of free healthcare and education to everyone. These were and still are vital issues for uh, people that identify across, you know, the, the spectrums of non-normative gender and sexuality, and I think also for people who identify as straight, frankly, and people that are cisgendered, as I am. And I neglected to say that my pronouns are he, him. That was meant to be at the very beginning of my talk. So I am a cis queer man, and um, a lot of my work in the last 10 years has sort of been focusing in a more and more direct way on, uh, on gender and sexuality and on the way, that, uh, the way that these forms of identity and forms of being in the world are recorded in the archive, are um, deeply personal, like a sort of personal archive where the body is an archive. And I guess the reason that I say that my work is increasingly focusing on these topics is because, uh, frankly, when I lived in Alberta the first time in the 90s and in the first couple of years of the 2000s, I really didn't feel safe here. I felt very unsafe. I felt physically unsafe when I was out of my own home a lot uh, because of my sexuality and my gender expression. Um, so although a lot of people probably look at me and say, oh, well, Mark presents as, as masculine, you know, he presents as a man, uh, there's something very deeply femme that I feel inside of me uh, that has nothing to, well, I mean, that is expressed in various ways, um, like various gestures in my art practice, various bodily gestures, ways that I present myself in public. So really it's just been, uh, I would say in the last decade or so that I have felt increasingly confident about my responsibility to, uh, to, to study these issues, both for the benefit of myself, but also, you know, I hope for, for the benefit of others. Okay, so I've, I've sort of talked around this piece. I've given a little bit of context and background about it. Now, I'll say kind of more about the composition, I guess. So this is an edition of artist multiples that are sweatshirts and t-shirts uh, that have this fragmented reworked version of Pierre Elliott Trudeau's message. And what I've chosen to do here is extract a part of Trudeau's quote where he says, there's no place and just extend the word no to the other nouns that are in his statement and the, the other kind of um, places that are in his statement. Uh, so no place, of course, is one translation for the term utopia. And uh, especially since working on a class called Queer Methodologies with a number of students, uh, current and former students that are in this meeting, um, I've been thinking over the years about uh, Jose Esteban Munoz's book uh, that studies the idea of a queer utopia and what it means to imagine uh, queerness as always on the horizon, always something that we aspire to, uh, that, we can, that we can live a state of queerness in the present, but we're always kind of aspiring for something else. I'm not sure if this is uh, too much to ask, but I do know that I can tell that somebody has their mic on and uh, I don't mind if you have a question, but there's a lot of breathing noise going on for me at this end. <laughs> so I'm not sure who it is, but if I could ask you to meet your mic, it would help me sort of stay focused. Um, okay, so no place, no bedrooms. I mean, what would it mean if we didn't think about sexuality and gender as being limited to the bedroom? Because clearly sexuality is expressed and gender is expressed everywhere, <laughs> you know, not only in the bedroom. And then, you know, also, what does it mean to problematize the notions of nation and state when we are in a colonized place? And when, uh, you know, especially when we're in a moment when 
our federal government and our provincial government and various arms of government are making claims around decolonization and reconciliation. And um, I want to see action around that, not just statement about that. So it's not that I am somebody who's saying abolish the state in this work, but instead I want to imagine a different future uh, where yeah, the current state of things, the current status quo could be reconfigured. Uh, so right, so the, the sweatshirt edition you see pictured here, and there's another version of it that is in French. Um, so you can see the design is just like a translated version. And um, this is largely because, of course, Pierre Elliott Trudeau is working in the two official languages of Canada, French and English. Uh, and also because, I mean, I, I have to be completely honest in that originally I'd imagine this to only be an English edition of the work, but a lot of my Francophone colleagues and friends in Quebec were saying, well, you know, if this has to do with Pierre Elliott Trudeau and, and kind of problematizing his legacy today, then it seems to make sense that you should also do a French version. Uh, so this is kind of like the merch announcement of my artist talk, which is to say that this, the, the black sweatshirt edition of this is sold out, but I do still have some white sweatshirts in French left, and I also have black t-shirts left. Um, so the, these are artist multiples that I printed, or actually that Megan Kirk printed. I was gonna say I printed with the assistance of Megan Kirk, but really Megan, um, who also goes by the name Jane Trash, is the, the person who physically printed these. So thanks, Megan Kirk. Okay, the next work that I wanted to share with you is a work that has to do with this photograph on the right. It's a photograph taken by the artist Marcel Moore of the artist Claude Cahun. And if you're not familiar with these two artists, I really recommend taking a look at their practices. These are two gender non-conforming surrealist artists working in the context of France mid-century and doing really, really innovative, fascinating surrealist photographic work and uh, working in other, in other media too. So in this photograph, we see the gaze of Marcel Moore looking at Claude Cahun. We also have this puzzling spatial arrangement of a mirror next to Cahun's face. Uh, and this really unusual jacket. I mean, I think that it's, it's easy to gloss over all of these details and perhaps for some of you this photograph is so familiar that you've actually really intensely studied these details. Um, but when I first saw this work in my own undergraduate degree in the late 90s, uh, I was immediately drawn into this, into this world that's created in this photograph. And I was especially fascinated with the jacket, but I also had a real fascination with the presentation of gender in this photograph. And of course, if you know Cahun and Moore's works, you know that they're very often performing identity and uh, doing so through different haircuts, um, makeup, garments, different presentations of objects that are around them to create this sort of like, yeah, this surreal expression of gender. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I had known about this photograph and had come across it here and there periodically. And then the curator, Michelle Gewurz, uh, contacted me to say, oh, I'm putting together this exhibition that's all going to be artists reacting to the legacies of Marcel Moore and Claude Cahun. Would you like to make a work for it? And I immediately said yes. And right away, I knew that this photograph was the one that I wanted to respond to in my piece for this group exhibition, which opened in Ottawa last year. And uh, so I knew this photograph was gonna be central in my work. And I decided that what I wanted to do was focus in on the jacket, focus in on this garment, because it's, it's quite clear to me that this is a, um, you know, a special garment, I guess, is what I would say. And part of what I think is special about it is that I suspect that this is a handmade jacket or 
uh, not necessarily made by the artist, but, um, but, a, but a unique garment. And some of that has to do with the unusual repeat pattern in the garment, which at first glance, I thought was woven into the textile, but um, it turns out that it was printed, we think. And when I say we, I'm thinking about Jesse Fraser and uh, Mackenzie Kelly Frere, who are, are two people who really helped me make this project come to life. So Mackenzie gave me lots of advice about interpreting this photograph and uh, Jesse, who I see is in attendance today, hello, uh, helped me to, uh, to work on a woven piece that is something I'm about to tell you about. Okay, so what I wanted to do was make enough yardage of fabric that someone could make the jacket that we see Cahoon wearing. I wanted to uh, just make that yardage and then present it as yardage. So what you see on the left-hand side is just an illustrator mock-up of what I imagined uh, that pattern might look like for uh, burning into a silk screen. And as I was developing this pattern, um, I mean, this is kind of the, 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 the turning point, I guess, in the piece. Um, it's when Mackenzie pointed out to me, oh, well, the, the pattern's not woven. You're going to have to screen print this. Um, and so nonetheless, I still had to weave the, this yardage of fabric, which I think in total is about, I think it's seven meters, maybe it's eight meters of fabric that's entirely hand woven using a loom at the Alberta University of the Arts. And uh, Jesse was responsible for helping me to get the loom all set up. I had done an undergraduate course in weaving. Uh, I didn't do very well in that class, honestly. And so this was a moment where I was really developing or yeah, further advancing my skills in weaving. Okay, so I'll show you what this uh, textile looked like once it was woven and printed. You'll notice I'm not showing you the selvage. I'm still a little bit shy about my selvage. I'm learning. Um, so the, the printing that you see here was done by Megan Kirk, a person who has really helped me in my studio practice. Um, especially with highly technical and very stressful things like printing silk screen onto a one-of-a-kind piece of fabric, which has been totally hand-woven. And uh, I think took me about six weeks or maybe five weeks, somewhere in there, to weave. So uh, thanks, Megan. I'm glad we're still friends and collaborators after I put you through this experience, uh, a rather nerve-wracking experience, I think. Um, not for me, uh, <laughs> because I, uh, you know, I was kind of on, a little bit on the sidelines for this. So anyway, big respect to Megan for making this possible. So I'll just show you the yardage. And the second part of this piece is that I worked with um, a garment designer, a, like a, a, a fashion designer in Vancouver to draft a pattern of what we think the jacket is. And that's what you see to the right of the, the yardage of this hand-printed fabric. Now, in the printing process, uh, one of the things that happened that I'm actually so happy about is that there was a minor misprint where two of the squares ended up butting up against each other. And, you know, I'm sure that Megan won't mind me saying that, you know, she called me when it happened and she was like, oh no, I've ruined your fabric. But once I actually saw it, I really loved the way that this, this grid work of the check pattern is sort of disintegrating and it's reworking itself. It's like a reconfigured version, a reimagined version of Cahoon's jacket. And of course, we can't see all of Cahoon's jacket. So maybe the back of this jacket actually does look the way that this fabric looks. Um, this sort of disintegrating grid pattern. Okay, so here's a detail that shows you that pattern. It's hand drawn with ink on uh, rice paper. And you can see that there's a layering of two sheets that have been placed over top of one another. So you see uh, there's a total of four sheets of paper here as if they're sort of spread out about to be uh, pinned onto, cut out and pinned onto the piece of fabric. So there's something latent here. Uh, there's 
I guess, like potential for this fabric to become the jacket, but it will, I'm never making the jacket. Uh, the jacket will never be made. It's, it's about stopping the process here and imagining the possibilities for what that garment could be. Uh, the next piece that I wanted to show you is part of a series of works. And uh, it is a series of works that use signage to imagine and speculate different spaces for queer conviviality. So the first one that we see here is called Entrance Lower Level. And it's a work that I created for a space that's called Window in Winnipeg. And I was, I was invited to create a space or to create a work for this space, which is a window. It's a, it's a 24 hour artist run center. It's always open because you just walk by on the street and, and there it is. So what I did for this work was I created signage imagining that on the lower level of the set and the southeast side of this building, there's a place called Détournement, which was established in 1968 in Winnipeg. It's only for members. And it has a dance club, a piano bar, a nail bar, a milk bar, a library, a vegetarian barbecue, and a crisis support center. So it has a lot of, a, a lot of things that, um, that I would like to see in a speculative space, uh, a speculative space for queer and other non-normative people. And its title is drawn from a couple, of, a couple of different places. So Winnipeg used to have a gay bar very close to, to this window space that was called Detour. And I learned about this through Divya Mera, um, who's one of the organizers of the window space. I'm not sure if Divya is still involved in it, but was at the time. And so Divya was telling me about Detour and the fact that it had closed. And, you know, this is a work that was made a matter of weeks after the tragic uh, Pulse shootings in Florida, in Orlando, at, at this bar called Pulse. And that's a bar that I used to go to uh, when I was doing an internship in Florida. And I mean, obviously it's, it would still be tragic even if I had never gone to that space, but um, it was, it, that event was very deeply felt for me, um, even though none of the people who were murdered are people that I know, uh, it remains a huge tragedy and a major event of loss and trauma. So I wanted to make a work that would uh, that would speculate about a kind of a private space, and I know the term safe space is overused, but a, a place that is safe, a place that is safe that, that would provide for people that I know um, and provide a space for congregation because it's, I mean, it's no secret that bars, restaurants, bookstores, and other spaces that are designed for and by queer and non-normative people are something of an eroding or disappearing uh, species. Uh, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people in this meeting remember Detour, the bar on 17th Avenue, uh, and lots of other spaces in Calgary that were places of congregation that no longer exist, including, you know, even restaurants for gays, lesbians, queer people, other non-normative people. And I suppose that when, when I talk about this sometimes with people, they say, oh, well, you know, it's just kind of a natural progression. Those spaces aren't as necessary anymore because now we have Grindr or now we have Scruff or now we have, I can't think of the other names, Bumbler? I don't remember what it's called. I'm bumbling right now. Anyway, uh, we have all of these different online apps. People can meet virtually and then, and then meet physically. And that's all we need. And I suppose if, if all you want is sex and all you're looking for is a, is a sexual encounter with somebody, then probably you're right. Yeah, social media, it probably is enough. Um, but anybody who tells you that that environment is enough to sustain vivid, like vivacious, uh, healthy, thriving, non-normative community is trying to sell you something. And I think it's important to remember too that things like Scruff are owned corporately. These aren't, you know, benevolent institutions that are, that are here to look out for us. Uh, so I'm so glad that we do have some places of gathering in this city and especially like that young people that I know 
are working so hard to, to make recurring events that take place for non-normative people. So I really want to, I really want to celebrate that. Okay. Uh, sorry, for some reason, something is going on here, but it didn't mean to happen. Okay. So this is just a, like a, a detail that kind of shows you the text in starker relief. So I think that I am nearly at time, but I wanted to show you the work in context here, just so you have a sense of scale and location. Oh, and maybe I'll mention too that there actually is a door on the, the other side of the building. Like if you follow the directions, there is this teeny tiny door that looks like a low door in the garden wall, to quote Evil Lenoir. It's like this small little door that could be used to go into some strange subterranean layer. Uh, so that if you follow the directions, you will find a space, but not a space that you can actually get into. So it's about imagining what's behind that door. And that is really the theme of the show at Latitude that's opening on November 13th, if I remember right. Uh, the show is called Portal. And it's about thinking of the archive, both the institutional archive and the personal and interpersonal archive as a portal that we use to connect with um, our ancestors, to connect with uh, communities and loved ones that we have lost and that we still have in our, in our lives. So I think that that's a, that's a nice note for me to conclude, but of course I'm very happy to hear questions from you folks. I'd love to be in dialogue with you. So can people hear me? Can you hear me, Mark? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm using two, uh, three different devices here, but anyway, um, that, that was fantastic. And I'm so sorry for the, uh, the heavy breathing. I think that was me. And, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me up to that, Michelle. Oh God, and that was just recorded. And, and sorry also for the, the glitchy beginning, but um, again, it's just so, so lovely to have you here. Um, and, and let's open it up to the floor. Are, are there questions? Such a dynamic speaker and such important issues that he's addressing. Just um, speak up, unmute yourself and go ahead. Or if you're shy, you can put something into the chat, or chat bar. Well, while people are organizing themselves, I did bring a visual aid. So this is the... This is the start of another This Will Never Be Over. I'm not going to show you all of it, but I like, <laughs> I like using Zoom to kind of uh, partially reveal an artwork. So this is kind of where things are going now. That's awesome. So you can see it in person, I hope, sometime soon. And the idea with this piece, so it started first, I thought, okay, I'm gonna make one of these. It's a way for me to think through these ideas that I've already talked to you about. And then I just wasn't done. So I made another one. And then I still wasn't done. So now I'm making another one. And I think it's, it's become true to the message, right? Like this will never be over. So I just have to keep making these, uh, you know, maybe forever. Um, so, my current plan is that I'm going to make at least one every year until I think the message doesn't need to be uh, repeated. Nice. <laughs> well, nice for you, I suppose. I've really got lots of work to do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that you could get help. You know, you could turn it into a, a community, co community action project. That is a great idea. There's and lots of talented people on this, uh, on this Zoom meeting who would... Uh, be quite happy. It's true. Well, I mean, I have benefited so much from collaboration over the years. And uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of the people that I've worked with are in this meeting right now. So I'm so grateful for all the help that you've offered. Um, I guess that some, sometimes my studio practice can feel a little bit lonely mm. when I'm working alone. And uh, yeah, I mean, 2020 has been a time, I think, where Loneliness is very much like on the, on the surface, like we're all, it's very foregrounded right now, sense of loneliness. Um, and also a sense of enforced productivity, I think, is something that many artists have felt. Uh, I have felt that over the summer. I mean, over the summer, I, I 
just maybe to take pressure off of all of us. I basically, I made these quilts and that's basically all I did all summer. I'm, and what I mean by that is I didn't really get very much done over the summer as an artist and uh, I didn't feel okay about that. And I still feel unsettled about that. But at the same time, I don't wanna to torture myself about the fact that instead, I think I really needed to focus on my partner. Um, I needed to focus on eating properly, resting, you know, asking after people that I know are at risk and people that are vulnerable. And that, those actions of being, I guess, and maintenance were, were really like that was the summer. And that was actually a lot of the year. And uh, now that teaching is kind of, you know, like taking up the whole window right now, or most of it, um, somehow that has actually opened up space for me to get back in the studio, weirdly. Uh, I can't really explain that. But anyway, I just wanted to share that because I think that as artists, th there was probably a lot of pressure on a lot of us to use this time and treat it like an artist residency and, you know, apply for all those grants that are just like all that money that's just out there uh, or apply for shows or why don't you develop a zine project? And I was just like, no, <laughs> I don't want to do that. I, I, I think that that feeling is broadly shared, Mark. Um, I can't speak for my colleague, Christine, but, but uh, certainly at the Nickel, you know, I felt like that every day. Gosh, I should be developing that big exhibition, doing this and doing that. And really, I just want to do this little thing. So. Well, one mess, I see there is a question from Dick, which I'll answer in, in just a second. Mm -hmm. here. But, um, I, I guess that one one note that I came across that really helped me is that uh, a friend shared with me the idea that in a moment of like in this ongoing crisis and trauma that is, you know, the conditions of colonization, that is the conditions of homo homophobia, transphobia, you know, all of these, these, these horrible conditions, we we help each other in ways that we can, but also it's not productive to think that your friends owe you something. You know, this isn't a time to be testing friendships. This isn't a time to be saying, well, I didn't get a text from that colleague this week, so the relationship is over. Um, I think that that, that I, I saw a lot of that happening, um, kind of different kinds of lateral violence happening especially on social media this year and uh so yeah th that's just something that i'm thinking about maybe that's just kind of pointless speculation in a way but okay so dick your question can you elaborate on any plans for a wider range of language um yeah so i have had some people approach me before about working in their favorite language i guess what i would i mean okay I'm just going to be completely honest about this. I have had different collectors approach me to ask me, well, we really love this language. Would you make a work in this language? Because we love this language. Like, let's say it's, um, I don't know, German. We love the German language. Will you please make us a text work in German? And my answer has always been no, um, which is, oh, I think it comes across as a very rude answer. Uh, but the thing, it's not that I would never make a work in German, but there has to be a reason for me to make the work in German other than just the commissioner of the work loving the language. Uh, for me, it's important to understand the languages that I work in. And that doesn't mean that I have to have like perfect comprehension of them, but if I'm using a key word in a language that is not my first language, I really want to know what I'm getting into, you know? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I'm sure that you can all speculate about the different kinds of scenarios that might come up for an artist who's asked to translate their own work into other languages, including languages that are not uh, familiar to them. But I have made, I have made work beyond French and English. Um, I did a work in Portuguese, uh, and also, I mean, I mean, kind of a companion piece to that work that was in a mixture of English and kind of like a, a what's the word I'm looking for? Like a slang version of Portuguese, like slang in Portuguese. 
And that was a work that I created during an artist residency, which I think was five weeks in the Azores, which is, if you're not familiar with it, is a part of Portugal, but is basically in the middle of the Atlantic. Like it's almost equidistant from North America and Europe. And uh, I, was, I was asked to make a site specific work for this festival that's called Walk and Talk, uh, a festival that I totally love. And please go look at what they do. They've done amazing online stuff this summer, despite uh, the travel restrictions and so on. So uh, I knew that I wanted to do something about the place. And of course, when it comes to biennials and festivals where artists are invited internationally, we're, we're all critical of the artist that kind of parachutes in, appropriates local culture, and then is like, see ya. Thanks for fun by the volcano, because the Azores is an active volcanic region. So I thought, okay, if it's going to be about the place, it has to be something about the place that I can either research or understand to a degree that I can, that I can like not have mastery of it, because I don't think that's the point, but that it, can, that it can mean something to me personally and also to the people that, that actually do live there. So I started to think about the island, uh, São Miguel, uh, where, the, where the project happened, as this midpoint. It's like an interstitial point between Europe and North America. It's, it's part of Europe, but you know, like if you've been to the Azores, it's, it really is its own place. It has uh, a very complex colonial history. Um, a lot of the horticulture has been imported from Japan. The plant life is like very unusual for its location. So I started to think about it as a queer place, like just a really, not just unusual, but that it's interstitial. You know, it's spatially, it's spatially ambiguous, it's spatially st strange. And I love the ambiguity that is at the core of a lot of the queer theory that I read. So I thought, okay, this is something I can really dig into. Um, and so I worked with the, the curator whose name is Jesse James to develop a sign that would advertise an imaginary space. So it's kind of like the detournement piece that I, uh, that I described to you. And so I started asking Jesse and other people associated with the festival about different terms that are used to describe the in-between. Basically like, what's a, what's a word that you would use to describe in Portuguese, the physical location of the Azores? And also maybe that could say something about a sexuality that is continually on the move. And more than one person that I talked to said, oh, intermediario, which is sort of like intermediate, but it can also mean intermediary. So it's both about, like it makes a kind of conversational line, but it's also about being in between, about always being ambiguous, like interstitial kind of is another word that came up a lot. Um, so I decided to name this space Intermediario and then was talking with different people of different non-normative identities on the island once I got there to ask them, what's something that you would love to see on this island that doesn't exist here yet or that you want to see more of? And then uh, I made this poster advertising this space called Intermediario that has all of this sort of like mixture of English and Portuguese and slang Portuguese describing these different things that will happen there, uh, including like there is a crisis support center, like with Detournement, but a range of other different things that people said that they really want. Do I still have one or two more minutes to say something more about that? I know I'm really, I'm really going for it, but because um, the, the last thing that I wanted to mention is that Another element of the history of the Azores and of Sao Miguel in particular that really bubbled to the surface in more than one person that I talked to had to do with the American military occupation of the Azores after the Second World War. There is still a limited, well, I mean, what does a limited, limited American military presence really mean? Jeez, but there is still a, mil a limited military presence of, of, uh, uh, of American military on that island. And um, in the 60s and in the 70s, if I've got my dates right, uh, these American officers that were on the island, you know, they're looking for entertainment and they're looking for sexual entertainment. And so there was a very active sex work uh, 
community that supported the economy of the Azores and of Sao, Sao Miguel, even like through to the 90s and in the present, this still, this still exists. And a lot of the people um, that do sex work on the island are trans people, are queer people, are bisexual, are queer, um, are intersex. Like th these are, I'm, I'm not saying exclusively that the people doing sex work are, that have these identities, but this was, this was a convergence on the island. And the thing that's so amazing about the Azores is because the economy was in such a bad state in the 60s, 70s, and even like up until like the last decade, um, those people that did sex work on the island were the breadwinners of the island and were really the heroes of the island. Sorry, uh, just getting a little emotional about that. Uh, so these are the people who were really like the heroes for saving the economy of the Azores and making it possible for people to still live in this very isolated place. And um, yeah, I have to say it was really amazing to talk to people from this uh, community who, who are still celebrating this as, a, as an important part of the legacy of the island. It's not something that is really publicized in the official tourist brochures because uh, now there are just, well, not now, but in uh, 2019, there were discount airlines that flew extensively from different European uh, airports to like continental European airports to the Azores. So tourism was really booming. And of course, these histories and this, this sustaining of the economy of the Azores is never included in those materials. So that was a really special part of being in this residency. Thanks for that question, Dick. Little did you know that you were gonna get a 20 minute response Oh, and then I guess there's a second question here. Do I have any thoughts or insight to share on the current status of text-based art in a broader field or disciplinary context? Yeah, that's, that is an interesting question. I mean, I would say that text-based artistic practice is very alive and well, if uh, indications from my students are any indication, which I really think that they are. So many of my students are doing really incredible work using text and working between different platforms like writing art criticism, but also integrating text into their drawings or into their installation or into their video. I mean, I, I've, I've kind of wondered if, um, you know, all of these technologies of communication, these different messaging apps that we use have at least one positive thing about them, which is that we, we, we live in a time of text. I mean, I think that we are awash in text. We're submerged and sometimes drowning in text. There's just so much, right? Um, especially if we're in isolation. And I mean, I, I suppose there is something that could be very damaging about that but I think there are a lot of possibilities to use text as a means of connection. You know, like that's really a big part of language, right? Uh, and personally, I find that text and encounters through text, including literature, but also, you know, theory, history, um, they can't replace in-person encounters, but they can be special in a different way and they can be meaningful in a different way. Uh, I'm finally back to reading fiction again, I was talking about this in my student podcast this week for one of my classes. Like I feel good about reading narrative fiction again for the first time since March 13th, 2020. And uh, I have found the reading that I'm doing in narrative fiction is actually profoundly healing. Uh, there's something about the voice. There's something about the written voice uh, that helps me to it can't replace like person to person conversation, but again, it's different. It's different. It is, it's profoundly nourishing. So I see a question from uh, Rachel. What are you reading right now? I just started the subtweet by Vivek Shreya. It's been on my list since it came out, but I wanted to wait until I was ready to meet her. I mean, I know her, but until I was ready to meet her text. And uh, I didn't want to start reading it at a time where I couldn't focus on it and, and give her ideas the attention that they deserve. So I'm, I'm diving deep into that. Uh, and I also just finished reading 
a series of graphic novels by Gillian Fleck, who's a graduate of AU Arts. I'm sure a lot of you know Gillian. So they have two amazing graphic novel series that I've been reading. One of them is called Double Digest. And it's, uh, its subtitle is Canada's number one teen cannibal comic. <laughs> if you have a problem with cannibalism, you might not want to read it, but it's really good. And then the other one is called Box Friend by Box Friend, which is um, a pair of graphic uh, novels. I mean, I guess there's, they could also be called zines maybe that follow the adventures of two genderless characters that, are, that take the form of boxes. So that's a little of what I'm reading right now. <laughs> Those sound really fun. And um, Vivek Shrey has certainly been on my list for a long time and I would love, love, love to bring her to Nickel at Noon. So watch this space one day, oh, yes, it's gonna happen. Um, we have like two minutes. Is there any other really quick questions? All those students, this is your moment. <laughs> Come on. You can also follow up with me on social media. Or you could do that. At Mark Klintberg. You can well, follow Mark the dog or our dog. Uh, at Fox the Irish Terrier. <laughs> this has been so terrific. And um, what a pleasure and what an honor to have you to have you here and sharing your, your work. It's just it's so interesting and so thoughtful. Uh, I'll just conclude today by reminding everybody that we bring different presentations every Thursday with or without technical difficulties, uh, hopefully without. Next week, we're uh, featuring um, Marie, Marika Cassis. Cassis um, she's doing a kind of an archaeology talk if you're interested in, in um, Kadir Hoyuk in Turkey. That would be really interesting. Uh, that will be hosted by my colleague Marina Fisher. And two weeks from now, a special note to us textile lovers, uh, Gwen McGregor is going to speak about her project Earthlings. Uh, Gwen is originally from Alberta, but is now living in Toronto. I don't have her bio in front of me, but I believe she's teaching both at MRU, uh, oddly, and also at the uh, OCAD. And she's going to be talking about a project that spans photography, textiles, performance and, uh, and, and other things. So that should be really interesting two weeks today. So thank you all for being here and for um, persevering with us. It's really great to see some familiar faces and lots of new faces. Uh, I hope that you'll join us again. We are recording this session and the recordings will, it might take a couple of weeks, but will be posted to the Nickel website um, so you'll be able to relive Mark Klintberg live at Nickel at Noon. <laughs> wow, I'm not sure if that's a punishment or a reward, but it's really been a delight for me. Thank you, everybody. It's, it's so nice to see you all, and I appreciate the questions and just the opportunity to talk through some of these ideas. It's, I see it as a, as a privilege to be able to, to talk over some of my work with you. So thanks well, for your time. Thank you so much, Mark, and thank you all. <laughs>